In this tutorial, we'll explore how inheritance works in the Godot game engine. I'm using Godot 3 here, but these lessons will also apply if you're using 2.1 still. Uh, in object-oriented programming, inheritance is a really powerful tool. You can define a class that inherits from another class, which means that it will contain the methods and variables of that class in addition to its own. Godot is very strongly object-oriented, and you can use inheritance when defining classes in scripts as well as with scenes. For this tutorial, we're going to assume we're making a classic top-down RPG, and we'll use Godot's inheritance capabilities to create two different kinds of characters in the game. Here's a preview of what we're making. So we have two kinds of characters here. We have NPC characters that you see wandering randomly around, and then the green character there is controlled by the player, and it's moving when I'm pressing the arrow keys. Starting with the project settings, I've made the width and height. I'm going to set those to 640 by 480. We are using 32 by 32 tiles for that tile set, so we don't need a really big screen for this. And then in the input map, I've also set up some input actions. And those are, are called left, right, up, and down. And specifically, and these are assigned to the arrow keys, corresponding arrow keys. But specifically, they're named that for use in the code later. It's going to make things easier if we have these names match the names of the directions that the player can move in. And if you download the art from the zip file that I'll link in the comments below, it has in it, you unzip that into your project folder, and it's got a couple of tiles for the grass and the stone walls. And then it has a folder called RPG Sprites that has sprite sheet and animations for a variety of different little RPG style characters. Now our goal in this project is to create two different kinds of characters. One controlled by the player and one that will be an NPC that will, will walk around by itself. But both of those characters are going to share a number of different properties and functions. They're each going to have a sprite sheet using one of these different sprite sheets that are all arranged in the exact same way. They have three frames of animation for each of the four directional movements. Uh, they're e so they're each going to need an animation player to play those animations. The game is going to be based on tile-based movement, which means that the characters when they move around will move from tile to tile. So if they're standing on one tile, they'll move exactly 32 pixels in whatever direction to go and stand on the next tile. There's no fractional tile movement in this example. And then of course they need to not be able to move through walls so they need some sort of collision detection. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a scene that contains all of those common features and all those common properties. So we'll start by making a new scene and we're going to add an Area 2D. Area 2D is going to be the because we're going to be moving it via animation, uh, I'm not worried about kinematic collisions or things like that. Obviously, you could do it that way too if that were the kind of thing you were going for. But this is going to be a character. We're going to call this character and save the scene. Now, this is going to need a sprite child. It's going to need a collision shape, collision shape 2D. It's going to need a tween. Uh, oops, didn't make that a child of the collision shape. I'm going to call this the move tween because this is going to handle the movement from one tile to the next, changing the character's position. And then we're going to need an animation player to actually play the animations themselves and change the sprite. So we're going to leave the sprite without a texture because each character will have a different texture. We're going to leave it blank here. But we can go ahead and make the collision shape since all of these are going to be the same. If you were doing something where your player character had needed a different hitbox than the NPCs, then you could leave that blank and set it on the individual um, objects. But we're going to set it here. So I'm going to add a new rectangle shape. And then I'm going to click on rectangle here, and I'm going to set the extents to 10 by 18, which is going to make a rectangular shape that's going to be the perfect size for our sprites. 
and let me just lock the children and drag it down on the screen so we can sort of see it in the middle. So now the animations are going to be based on these textures. If you haven't done sprite animation before using the animation player, we're essentially going to be changing the frame of the sprite. So on the sprite, we need to configure it with the number of frames that it has. So there's an animation section here. Number of vertical frames, number of horizontal frames. Well, we have three horizontal and four vertical. So set that to three and that one to four. Four vertical frames, three horizontal frames. And then changing this property, we'll step through each one. I'll snap one in there real quick just so you can see what it looks like. So as I move the frame property, you'll see we're going through each of the frames until we get to the 12th one. And we'll go back to zero. And so the animation player is going to change those over time to give the walking animation for the direction we want. So in the animation player, I have created four animations, up, down, left, and right. And again, making sure that they match the same spelling I used in the input actions. Lowercase, uh, spelled exactly the same, because they're going to use that name, the same name in our variables in our script. So this is the new animation button. So I just click that four times and name them each. Now each one is going to be 0 0.8 in length. That's how long we want the animations to be. And you can zoom out a little bit so you can see we're going to have our step in our animation player is set to 0.1, so it, see it snaps each one. So basically we're going to do a frame of animation every other step. And for example, when we're on the sprite, when we're on frame number zero, that's the first frame of the walking up animation. So I'm on the up animation, and I'm going to kick, click the keyframe next to the frame property when I am on zero. And it asks me if I want to create that. Yes. Now we move over to number two, and we're going to use frame number one. Then we move over to 0 0.4, and we're going to use frame number two. And then we go to number six, and we're going to go back to frame number one. So we have 0, 1, 2, 1. And if I go back to the start here and hit play, you see we have a little walking. And then it gets to the end, and we're going to stop. And that's because I don't want this to loop because this is going to play one time moving one square. So just do that same thing for each of the other three animations and I will jump ahead. So I've made the other three animations. Now they're each set up and we'll go in whatever direction we want. Can hit play here. You can see there's the walking to the right one. And the last thing we need to add here to our character is the collision detection. The nodes that are going to detect whether it can move into the next square. So if it's standing on a square and we say move right, but there's a wall there, we want it to not move. So we're going to use raycast for that. So if we add a raycast 2D and then duplicate it three more times. And we're going to name these raycast left, right, up, and down. And by default, raycasts are off, so make sure you Select all of them and check it to enabled. And we need these to point in the direction they're going. So raycast left is going to point to negative 32, 0. Raycast right will count will cast to 32, 0, up and down, and so on. Let's set the sprites texture back to null. Don't strictly have to do this, but uh, you don't strictly have to do this, but I like to do that to just keep it clean. This doesn't have any assigned texture to it. So now let's add a script to the character. Character.gd is fine. And this script is going to contain all of the code to make the character move. So we'll start with a few variables. Tile size is going to be the size of our tile grid. We're going to have a, a flag called can move that is going to determine whether you're allowed to move or not. If you're already moving, that will be set to false so that we can't initiate a move in the middle of a move animation. 
facing is going to be what direction we are facing in and then we're going to have what each of the movement what direction each of, each of the movement goes and also which ray casts match up with them so that's two dictionaries each using the directions as the keys and these are the four directions up down left and right and these are the four the names of the four ray casts that we made over here now for our move function this is the function that we're going to call whenever a character needs to move and it's we're going to pass it what direction we want to move in so we'll change our facing direction to whatever that is but if we're going to check the raycast in that direction so raycasts facing if it's colliding If the raycast in the direction we're facing is colliding, then we cannot, oops, I forgot a parentheses there, then we cannot move, so we will return. Otherwise, we can move, so we'll set can move to false, and we will play the associated animation. So we get the animation player and say play that matching animation. That's why we kept the animation names the same. So if our facing is right, we're going to play animation right. So now we need to move. And we're going to use the move tween for that. And we're going to use its interpolate property method. And that's going to allow us to change the character's position. So we want it to act on ourself. Position is the property that we're going to be interpolating. Let me zoom in here a bit so we can see everything. So we're going to change it from its initial property, or sorry, its initial value, which is position, and then we're going to change it to position plus whatever direction vector points in that direction times the tile size. We want it to last 0 0.8 seconds, right? That's the same duration as our animations have. And then we're going to use the trans sign uh, tween method. And then we're going to use the ease in out tween direction. Now we want to start the tween. And we're going to return true. And the reason we're doing that is so that whenever we call move, we're going to get back a false if we weren't able to move, and we're going to get back a true if we were. And we can use that in our code elsewhere to determine whether the move was successful or not. And you can see I've been programming in Python lately, so I capitalized true. And finally, to allow movement again, we're going to connect the signal from the move tween the tween completed signal. Let's connect that. Adds our function here. And what this is going to do is set can move back to true. So that when the move is completed, it's allowed to make another move. And that's it. That completes our character. So now we have a character defined that knows how to move around on the grid. And that's the stuff that's the same between the player and the NPC. So now we need to do the stuff that's different. So we, we're going to make a new scene for our player. And the new scene for the player is going to be based on this character scene. So we're going to click Scene. And instead of clicking New Scene, we're going to do New Inherited Scene. And when we do that, it asks us to pick what scene. So we're going to inherit from the character scene. Okay. Now I have a new scene that's an inherited scene, and you can tell that because it has the little clapper here that tells you it's inherited from another scene. I'm going to rename this to player and save it. And now we can go and start making our changes to things we want to change. For example, the sprite. I want to change the sprite. I want to give the sprite a texture. I'm going to use the little green archer guy 
for my player texture. And the rest of the stuff is going to stay the same, right? I already have the raycast pointing in the right direction. I have the collision shape ready to go. Everything's good there. If you had other things to add to your player, like additional nodes to represent weapons or things like that, you could just add them in here and they would get added on. But what we need to do now is add some functionality to the script because we want to listen to the input actions. So the script that's currently attached to the player is the same one, the same character script that we just made. But I don't want that. So I'm going to clear the script and add a new one. And for this new one, we're also going to inherit. So right here where it says inherits area 2D, I'm going to click the little folder and pick character. So now this player script is going to inherit from character.gd. Hit create, and there we go. That's what it says up there at the top. So now our script includes everything that the character script had in it, and then we can add what additional functionality we want. All we really want is to check for input actions. So I'm going to do that in the process function. Now there's two ways you could do this. You could do this in the input function if you want it to only move once when you push the key and then you've got to push the key to move again. Uh, by doing it in process I'm going to allow you to hold the arrow key down and it'll continue to move one square at a time in that direction. So if we can move. So if the can move variable is true, then we're going to check the four input actions. So I'm just going to do a loop to do that. So we get the keys of the moves dictionary are left, right, up, and down. So if input is action pressed, and we're going to use the whatever direction, because we named the actions up, down, left, right as well. Then we're going to move in that direction. And you can actually go ahead and try it out. Play the scene. And there's my character. If I pre hold down the right arrow key, you see I'm stepping one square at a time. If I just tap it, I'll move one square. And I can move in whatever direction I want to go. So hopefully this inheritance concept is starting to make sense to you now. But uh, let's go ahead and make one more, just to be clear. We're going to make another new inherited scene that inherits from character. And I'm going to call this one NPC. And so the NPC scene, unlike the player scene, is going to sort of wander around the screen randomly. So we're going to leave the texture blank. We'll add in our script that we're going to randomize that. And we're going to go ahead and add the script. So we'll remove the one that was there and inherit from character for our script. And so for our NPC, one thing we want to do is pick a random texture. So I'm going to add a, I'm just going to make a list here. And you can put whatever ones you want in there. But here's a list of a few of the textures that are available in the art folder and I want it to pick randomly. So I need to do that in the ready function. So let's make sure we randomize, and then we're going to pick a texture out of that list. So out of that list, we want to pick a random index. So we pick a random number, and we modulo with the, with the textures.length or sorry, size. Talking Python again with length. So we pick whatever texture we want, and then we can load it. And we'll load it from the folder it's in. It's in the art RPG sprites. Actually, I can get a bunch of this. And then we'll use the string replacement percent %s to stick that file name in there. And then we tell the sprite to set its texture to that. And we'll also set our facing to a random direction. And 
we'll just take the keys of the move and pick a random value out of it. Now we can do the same thing here. Now the one option here is we can in process check if we can move and if we can then we'll try moving. But remember when we try moving it's going to return false if we were unable to. So we can just say if not move. So if we weren't able to move then we're going to randomly change direction again. So let's just copy and paste this in there. And we'll pick another random direction if we weren't able to move. And that'll be fine, except these NPCs are going to wander in a totally straight line until they hit a wall, and then they're going to turn. And what that's going to do is make them eventually start clumping up on the walls and just walking along the walls. So let's also add a little bit of randomness in here. So we'll also randomly change direction if we randomly pick a number between 1 and 10, and it's greater than 5. So that way, half the time as they're walking, they might just randomly turn left or right. And that should do it. So now if we were to run this one, we should see this little sprite wandering around. There it is, changing direction sometimes, but just sort of wandering. Now the part we can't test right now is the walls. So the last thing we need to do is create a little environment for these characters to walk around in. So let's add a new scene and I'm going to just use a node, call this the main scene. And in this we're going to use a tile map. So let's add a tile map and set its cell size to 32 by 32 so that it matches. And for the tile set, you can go and you could make one out of the grass and stone, but I've gone ahead and in the art folder saved a tile set that's already made that makes the stone have a collision shape on it and the grass not. So the stone will be the obstacle. So we'll just drag that into tile set. And then we zoom out a little bit. You should be able to just sort of paint your world. Let's just actually put walls along the edges. I'm holding down shift and dragging to get these straight lines. Uh, we'll use the bucket fill to fill the inside with grass. And then you can put some walls on the inside if you want to have some other kind of obstacles to go around. All right, and that's a quick tile map that we can use. And then we want to add some characters to it. So let's instance a player in there. And let's instance a few NPCs. NPC, and I'll duplicate it a few times. Now the problem we have is we're going to drag these guys around and put them in different places, but they're not going to be lined up with the grid. So if my character was right here, for example, he'd try to move 32, or if he's this far away, he would move 32 and then be sort of offset from the wall. And it's going to look weird. We want them to be on the grid. So to do that, go to your snap to grid settings and then configure snap, set it to 32 by 32, but also set the offset to 16 by 16 because we want the characters to be placed at the center of a tile. And then we'll also turn on the little magnet which enables snapping. So now you see as I move around I'm snapping directly to the center of a tile. So I can now put these and know that they'll be starting on a tile and then since I know they move exactly 32 pixels they will always end up on the next tile. So let's hit play and see what happens now. There we go. They are detecting the walls. You see them turning away when they hit a wall. And so will the player. If I walk up here, I can't go through the wall. If I keep pressing up, nothing happens. All right. 
Now, some other things you could do, and if you wanted to go for more of a turn-based kind of game, is that you have the player, you give the player a signal. Ah, look, these two sprites have moved at the same time, and they've wound up on top of each other. But now they're detecting each other as a collision, so they can't move. So one way to get around that is to go to the NPC and set them to set their collision, just take them out of layer one so they won't they just won't see each other. And then they won't uh, have that problem. But as I was saying, you give the player a signal, like a, mo a moved signal. And whenever the player moves, you emit that signal. And you make the NPCs listen for that signal. You connect that signal to them, and they only call their move when they they only call their move when they detect that signal, right? And so, so that way they would only move when the player moves. And if you stand here still, so do they. And that's how you would do something more turn-based. And you can extend this in lots of ways. If you want to start adding, if you wanted to add monsters, they could extend from character. If you wanted to add pets that follow you around, they could extend from character and so on. So the, the concept is pretty flexible and hopefully gives you some ideas of how you can apply it to your projects, especially as your projects start to get bigger and bigger and more complex. This becomes really necessary because if you imagine the alternative, if we hadn't done this inheritance, then our scripts would look both players, both the character and the NPC would have to have all of this code in it. And if we then decided we wanted to change any aspects of how the movement works, we would have to go and change it in every single individual script and make sure that they all match up. And that becomes really, really tedious, especially if you have lots and lots of different types of characters. So in anytime you're finding yourself repeating code and having different objects that share a lot of either properties or nodes, if their scenes are very similar, or if their scripts are very similar, then you probably want to think about using inheritance to do it. All right, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.